So I'm very excited to come out and talk to you a little bit about uh, the musculoskeletal findings in NF1. In fact, I've worked very closely with uh, your great team of uh, physicians, uh, Dr. Friedman um, has been, uh, and Patricia, and uh, Kimberly Jett, and the whole group. We've worked uh, together, and many of you have probably participated in some of our studies, trying to get a better understanding of uh, the musculoskeletal findings in NF1. But today, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus on physical fitness and what it means to be physically fit. Uh, it'll involve a lot about the muscle, but um, hopefully this will be a a talk that will help us get all a little bit more physically fit. But for, I don't know how many of you have ever heard this, you know, you go to your doctor and they say, well, just uh, stay fit and eat right. I don't know if that's the best uh, advice. It is good advice. We need to stay fit. We need to eat right. But we need tools that are catered to our, um, our individual needs, our skill sets, our capabilities. And that differs for everybody, and it differs for people that have specific disorders. And for NF1 in particular, I think if you just tell your kid, go, oh yeah, go exercise and uh, don't eat a lot of ding-dongs, and um, it, it might not work. So what we first need to understand is what are the problems? So what are the aspects that hinder us from being physically fit? And then are there ways that we can cater to those specific strengths that an individual has uh, to improve the specific weaknesses. So today, um, we're going to go through each of these findings uh, to see what is abnormal in NF1 and what can we do to, to potentially become uh, more physically fit. So what is physical fitness? When someone says, uh, well, you need to be physically fit, and, uh, it's a set of attributes that allows us to perform physical activity. And that's what we, we all need to do. We need to perform specific tasks. We need to be able to be, become physically active. Um, but it includes a large number of variables. I actually uh, looked at uh, what are the attributes in terms of how does someone uh, become physically fit. And it involves a lot of health and skill-related factors. So, for example, bone integrity, muscle strength. So we're going to go over all of these variables and health-related skills to see is there a problem in NF1. I won't have time to go through many of them in detail. We'll focus a lot on bone integrity, muscle strength, coordination and balance, and what, what is known in NF1. Uh, so first, is there a problem with bone? I, I hope that many of you know that there is an abnormality in, in bone in NF1, and we've done a lot of work over the last decade to try to better uh, determine that there is a problem with the bone. There are localized findings, and then there are generalized findings, and not everybody has a specific bone problem, um, but we're going to go through each and every one of these uh, in, in, in detail. A sphenoid wean dysplasia is seen in about 3% uh, to 5%, depending on what study you, you look at. Um, it's often associated with a plexiform neurofibroma on the same side, but this is a bone in the skull, and it causes a proptosis, so that where the eye uh, socket um, kind of doesn't hold the, the globe uh, intact. Um, and Unless you do a CT scan, sometimes you, you, you might not be able to identify that. There's not a large majority of problems that to result in this. Uh, the plexiform neurofibroma can cause a lot of disfigurement. Um, bone overgrowth. So in some individuals, this is one of my patients who has an overgrowth of the bone where uh, there's also plexiform associated with it, but it also impacts the bone. So we know that the bone is uh, compromised. And then tibial bowing is probably one of the most... Uh, problematic findings, but it is only seen in about 5% of individuals with NF1. Um, and we've done a lot of work trying to figure out what is this bowing of the bone and what does it do? And why is the bone abnormal and how does it hinder physical fitness? So you can see here's a child with anterior, so it bows on, on the anterior side and on the lateral side, and some radiographs that show this bowing. What happens in some individuals, and uh, it doesn't happen in everyone, but it proceeds to a fracture where it doesn't heal. And you can see, if you look at the x-ray here, where that bone is very thick right here in the middle portion, but once it breaks, it just starts to disintegrate. You start to see the sucked candy looking appearance, and there's this 
a proliferation of tissue in between the two bone segments, and it just doesn't heal. In fact, this is a child who had uh, one of our uh, patients that had pseudarthrosis, and you could just take the bone and move it back and forth. There wasn't a significant amount of uh, healing that was going on. And it's very problematic to get these bones to heal. In fact, uh, many times uh, we did a study, and it could be upwards of 14 surgeries for some people uh, that are unsuccessful. You can see this is a rod going through that tibia trying to hold that uh, tibia in place and trying to keep that bone um, or trying to help that bone to heal. And frequently, it's unsuccessful, and amputation is uh, sometimes needed. But we wanted to say, well, what is the actual abnormality of the bone? What happens before this bone breaks? Why is the bone abnormal? And could that relate to the rest of the skeleton in individuals with NF1 that don't have just the bowing problem? So this is actually a CT scan of the leg. So this is a cross-section of the leg as it goes right through the lower part. And this is a child right here who has bilateral tibial bowing, so both legs are affected. And when we look at the... CT scan of the right and the left leg up at the top compared to somebody who doesn't have NF1, a control individual down here, you can see, I don't have a pointer, I think that, well, right here, you can see that this is the cortex of the bone and it's very, very thick. So some people think, well, that, why would that, why would a thick bone break? And it's not a thin cortex, it's actually a very thick cortex where you have almost no medullary canal compared to here is a bone from an individual uh, without NF1 where there's this very wide canal and a normal structure of the bone. So that was a little bit perplexing to us why that would be the case. Um, so we've taken some samples of bone from individuals who don't have NF1 and individuals that had NF1 after it broke where they had surgery to remove the bone and we did a micro CT scan uh, looking at the actual composition of the bone. So th these are actual, uh, in this is an individual, we collected bone from people who died from uh, motor vehicle accidents who didn't have NF1. Um, just so you know, I didn't take out people's normal <laughs> bone. Um, but this is, a, this is a tibia from a control sample, and you can see how uh, thick it looks. So you can see the cortex is quite normal with a normal medullary canal because you actually, it's a, it's a three-dimensional structure that if you don't have good uh, function, it can, it can break. This, these are the samples of people that had already broke, and I showed you how once it breaks, it kind of gets eaten away in suck candy appearance. But you can just see that this is that portion of the tibia, and it just looks like Swiss cheese. It looks very disorganized. Just You can't imagine how that could hold any pressure or uh, stress. Here's another sample of a control bone with... Uh, samples from three different individuals. These are the cross-section here of this sample right here of this sample. And you can see it just looks like trabecular bone, meaning that kind of uh, not a solid looking bone. Very, it's not as dense. Um, the density of the bone is abnormal. So it really goes to show that the bone is significantly um, abnormal and this, there's some sort of dysplasia where the cells don't know what to do and it's a disorganization. Um, but we never knew what, what it looked like before it broke. Because once it breaks, it then kind of gets eaten away by the bone cells. But there was this uh, one patient who uh, had such a severe bowing that they elected to have surgery before it actually broke. Um, I, I'm not recommending any of that. That's just what happened, and the bone was sent to me. But here is the picture of that bone after it was removed right here. And you can see there's just no canal almost at all on this bone. And we wondered, what is the structure and what does this look like? And so we did the same thing with a control. Here's a control bone, a 2D slice going down the longitudinal aspect. And this is the tibia of that other, uh, of, the, of that bone sample compared to a control. And you can see there's almost no medullary canal. And this is a picture of it cut in cross section. And it's just very thick, and you can see some um, abnormal microporosities. In addition, here's a 3D rendering of it. You can see it just looks kind of Swiss cheese-like compared to a, a control sample. So we then did this uh, 
Now this is unpublished data, and uh, we've been working with a group in Germany who have a mouse that has tibial bowing, so an NF mouse model. Um, and we looked at the density of the bone. So the redder it is, the more dense it is. The bluer it is, and this doesn't show up very well, but uh, when we looked at it, we could see that the bone is less dense, and particularly it's less dense in this area where there's this blood vessel coming in. And there's this abnormal kind of wide blood vessel and decreases in density compared to the other regions. And here's the blood vessel uh, region in the control tibia, and there's no differences in the two regions. And what's interesting is in the mouse model, there are these huge blood vessels that cause these defects compared to a control mouse model. And when they did strength testing in the mouse model, they showed that the fracture point was triggered at this spot where there's this uh, decreased density and increase in this blood vessel. So the major structural stability was, was here. And that's based on a mouse model, of course, and humans, of course, are not mice, but still we get a little bit of uh, insight into maybe what's the lead site for a fracture in these uh, tibial bowing patients. Um, we've also looked at the actual segments to show that the bone that is there is unmineralized bone. So this red portion shows that it's just not mineralizing well. And the cortical bone, so the thick part of the bone, is very Swiss cheese looking. It's trabeculized. So it shows that there's a problem with the way NF1 tells the bone cells to function. Now this is in people that had just that localized bone finding. But we don't know who's going to go on to fracture. So if someone has anterior bowing, how do we know? Are they going to need 14 surgeries and it's never going to work? We just don't know. And one of my studies right now is trying to find predictors of who's going to go on to fracture. But I have this patient here who had bowing. And then over the years, it just straightened out. So this is at seven years of age, and you can see him right here. It was pretty mild bowing, but we just don't know what who's going to go on to fracture and who's not. Um, in fact, there was this, I have another patient who, on physical examination, the leg to look totally straight. On the x-ray, you can tell there's probably some abnormality, a little bit of bowing. And on the CT scan, there was thickening of the bone. And it broke, and it's not healing up. So we just don't know, just by looking at the leg, is it going to break and heal? We just don't have any good ideas yet, but we're trying to find uh, whether or not there are certain blood markers, urine markers, and ultrasound findings that may predict who's going to go on to fracture and who's not, and who's going to go on to heal. But it's not restricted just to the leg. The arm can be affected, so the radial and ulnar bowing and pseudarthrosis. You can just see how this bone just got totally eaten away. So the other bone findings are scoliosis. Scoliosis is seen in about uh, 10 to 30 percent of people with NF1. There's dystrophic scoliosis where it's a very sharp angle. Um, and then there's a milder type of scoliosis. So it can range from very mild to very severe. So we know that that impairs uh, physical activity. Um, other bone findings, this scooped in chest or this chest that sticks out, we call them pectus abnormalities. Those are quite frequent in NF1. They don't cause a lot of problems. Um, bone cysts uh, have been seen in NF1, these cysts in the bone that sometimes can, can fracture and not heal. And then I think the thing that applies uh, to all individuals with NF1 is that there have now been multiple studies that have shown that there are decreases in density of bone. And there have been two studies in adults with NF1 that showed increase in fractures compared to the general population um, with NF1 individuals. We're still trying to tease that out, but I think there's enough evidence in, in bone density studies and in also looking at the cells that uh, uh, eat away at the bone and build up the bone to show that osteopenia and osteoporosis can be a major issue in NF1. And one of our questions is how can we improve that? What are the, what are the ways that we can increase uh, osteoporosis or decrease osteoporosis so that uh, subsequently as you become an adult, um, you don't have an increase in the number of fractures. So I hope I've convinced you that uh, bone is abnormal in NF1. But what about muscle? So I don't think that, that might have been Lance Armstrong, I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> so we did some studies of NF1, just people that didn't have tibial dysplasia, where we did the same 
cross section of the of the leg, we were looking at the bone to see if there's any bone density studies uh, or bone density problems. But what we found was that the muscle mass was decreased, and there was a lot of intramuscular fat as well within the in the muscle. And when we looked at uh, individuals uh, without NF1 compared to individuals with NF1 without a skeletal problem and those with a skeletal problem, the muscle area was decreased in NF1. And that brought up some questions of whether or not muscle was abnormal in NF1. And nobody had really been looking into this at all. So the group in Germany created a mouse model where they knocked out the NF1 gene, so there's no NF being produced in the limbs, um, the mesenchymal cells, so the limb, which would be the bone and the muscle. And when they looked at this, and it's just in the limbs, here's the tricep muscle of a control individual, and here's the tricep muscle of an NF1 uh, mouse. And you can see how much smaller that, that muscle is. But the mice in general were smaller also. But then they looked at uh, the actual muscle, and they showed all this fibrosis, abnormal uh, clefting into the uh, muscle. It's abnormal myogenesis. So the muscle was, be was abnormal, almost like a muscular dystrophy type of picture in these, uh, in these mouse models. And uh, this is Aaron Schindler from Australia. And he created an NF knockout mouse where all of the muscles in the whole body and only just the muscles were abnormal, uh, meaning they knocked out all NF1 in just the muscle cells. All the rest of the cells were normal, but just the muscle cells had all of NF1 uh, knocked out. And they were significantly smaller, and they all died between uh, day three and six, suggesting that NF1 does play a role in how muscle develops and how muscle is regulated. So when, then we said, okay, well, well, what about humans? I mean, once again, humans aren't mice, so we need to get data on humans. So this is a strength, grip strength, uh, what we call a dynamometer, where you just squeeze it to see how strong you are. And we had, we had this dynamometer, and we used it to test a bunch of different syndromes that are all related. And maybe some of you have heard about this, but NF1 is just one of a multitude of syndromes that are all involved in the same genetic pathway. So there's something called Costello syndrome, Legia syndrome, uh, CFC, Noonan, and they're all due to mutations in uh, a pathway that's related to NF1. So we decided to look at all these different syndromes and also look at individuals who don't have any of these syndromes to see if their strength was abnormal. And this is what we found. These are controls right here. And this is the strength, the force that they could do on this grip strength. And we looked at NF1 compared to controls, and NF1 individuals were significantly weaker than individuals with controls. And they were pretty similar to all the rest of these uh, rasopathies or these uh, syndromes that have the same defect in the genetic pathway. So now we now have evidence that there's a, a problem with strength in some individuals with NF1. Now, not, not all of them. You can see some of these NF1 individuals uh, reached above control. But just on average, there was a, a weakness in NF1. So hopefully I've shown that strength is a, a problem in NF1, and we want to determine how we can fix that. But what about agility, balance, and coordination? So those are other things that help us become physically fit. If we can't uh, stand on our feet and keep falling over, of course, we're not going to be able to do physical activity. So I surveyed parents of 28 children with NF1 and asked if they were less coordinated compared to other individuals of the same age without NF1. And this is just a parent uh, perception. Um, uh, but about 80% said, yeah, my, my kid with NF1 is just clumsy and less coordinated, has problems participating in sports. So that made me think, okay, well, maybe there's an issue with coordination and balance. And so what we did is we uh, used this motor proficiency test. So it's a, a test used by physical therapists to, to assess whether or not you're having problems with different areas of motor coordination. And it involves game-like tasks like balancing on a leg, bouncing a ball, cutting out a circle. There are these eight subtests. It's a clinically valid study that's used in uh, lots of developmental coordination disorders. It's valid just for children, 4 to 21 years of age. It takes about an hour to complete. And so we have a physical therapist that did this. And this is just an example of our NF1 patients who 
uh, did these tests, uh, and it's broken up into upper limb coordination, balance, running speed and agility, strength. There are a number of these uh, subtests that then give us a, a total score. And so the total motor composite, so the results of all those tests put together, uh, 22 out of 26 uh, kids with NF1 were well below or below average for these uh, measures. There was no, nobody that was uh, above average. And uh, the Z-score, which just is an indicator of how, how impaired uh, they are, was statistically significant, uh, and they were much lower for their total motor composite. So we then looked at each individual subset of scores. So fine manual control, manual coordination, body coordination, strength and agility. They were all low as well in NF1 individuals. But what was interesting is that uh, when we did a fancy statistical uh, thing, uh, most of the variance was due to strength and agility. So it seemed like the majority of the problem was in their strength and their agility, although we do know that they were having problems with uh, coordination and balance as well. So I, I decided to ask, uh, also we used this questionnaire to see, well, how active are individuals with NF1? Are they getting out there and uh, participating in sports? Are they, what's their activity levels? And we did this with the other syndromes as well. And this is just, this is preliminary data, but NF1 individuals had a decrease in their activity hours. These are metabolic equivalents per week. Um, Compared to controls, uh, but we haven't done a statistical analysis to see if it's uh, um, truly abnormal. But uh, looking at about 200 people with NF1 compared to about 160 controls, it seems like their activity levels are a little bit less than uh, the general population. So we wonder if increasing that physical exercise could improve these musculoskeletal findings in NF1. So if anyone's ever None of you have been in space, but astronauts, when they go up in space, they lose all their bone. They become osteoporotic because they're not loading their bones. They're not putting forces upon their bones. So we decided that we wanted to try to improve the bone density issue and, uh, we'd, and also improve strength. So we're currently investigating the effects of a jumping program. So it's a specific type of physical exercise program to hopefully improve muscle coordination, muscle strength, and bone quality. And... We're currently, um, the study's in progress where we have people with, uh, we randomize the NF1 individuals into those people who um, uh, get this exercise program and people who just continue on with their normal um, activity. Um, and this is just some preliminary data looking at their strength for after 10 weeks of getting this physical therapy. And there looks like in the intervention, at least in the strength portion, there's some improvements this is, a, not a, this is just a jumping program, so it's not focused on improving all aspects of physical activity. But we have some hope that maybe physical therapy will help improve um, some of these outcomes. Um, so hopefully I've shown you that balance, coordination, and agility are all impaired in NF1. And that we have some hopes that we can help improve some of those aspects with targeted therapies. But we're also interested in metabolism and energy expenditure. So what we've done is another study where we have people sit on this bike, and they ride this bike, and we measure their VO2 peak aerobic capacity. So it shows um, basically how they're using energy. And we looked at their power, and we also measured lactate to see if there's any problems with mitochondria or energy metabolism. And these are uh, preliminary data with just small numbers. Uh, none of it reached statistical significance, but it did look like that individuals with NF1 had an abnormality in their aerobic capacity, and there was an elevation in their lactate measures as well. However, uh, we're still looking into that a little bit more, but there was a group in uh, Brazil uh, who did the same type of thing with a treadmill test and looked at maximal oxygen uptake, and there was abnormal energy expenditure in uh, the NF1 adults. So we don't know if this, if basically this abnormal energy expenditure is due to just because they're not exercising enough, they're not as active, or is it an intrinsic abnormality of uh, uh, energy and metabolism? Uh, we don't know yet. But one of the things that we... Uh, 
lead us to believe that there's some sort of uh, actual intrinsic meta uh, metabolic uh, process is uh, Aaron Schindler from the group in Australia have now looked at the, those muscle mice uh, and they show that there's all these fat depositions in the muscle. So these little red dots are all lipid uh, depositions within uh, the muscle. And they've actually, this is just preliminary data as well, in an individual with NF1 compared to two individuals without NF1. And you can see that the individual with NF1 in the muscle uh, fibers have all these lipid inclusions as well. And they've done a lot of uh, detailed metabolic studies that I'm not going to go through. It's very complex. Uh, uh, but basically, it's showing that there's a problem with fatty acid oxidation. And uh, the, the NF1 is a regulator of muscle metabolism. So I hope I've shown that there's an abnormality of uh, metabolism as well. And then mental, social, and emotional. We know that there are learning problems, ADHD, cognitive delays, social skill problems, perceptions with peers that all probably impact uh, participation in uh, physical activity. Um, I'm not going to go into detail on those, but in general, we do know that there are a lot of uh, abnormalities in each of these areas. Cardiovascular thickness is probably an issue as well. But what we want to do is try to identify areas, like we're doing with this physical exercise study, to impact each of those uh, areas so that you can maximize the amount of uh, exercise that they're doing. Because I'm, I'm a little concerned if I tell my patient, well, just go out and uh, uh, play sports. and it, and if you go out and they say they're going to have uh, PE time, and I've actually done this where I go and I look at people who are in their um, uh, recess time at schools, and you can see people that are being very active, and then you see people that just kind of stand in the field or they stand to the side, and they're not really participating in those uh, group sports. So we need to find what are the activities that interest them, what are the activities that are going to improve the deficits that they have, and it is a, it's a process to try to figure out how to do that. So in summary, um, there's abnormal strength, energy expenditure, and motor coordination in NF1 that likely impacts their quality of life. Um, I also think there's a potential impact of the problems with the muscle on uh, other clinical findings, like scoliosis. I, it's my personal opinion that some of the scoliosis is due to uh, intrinsic muscle problem and hypotonia, and um, I think that it also impacts many of the other um, clinical findings in NF1. Uh, but components that impact uh, physical fitness in NF1 are impaired, but we can identify the weaknesses and we can identify the strengths to try to improve that. So right now we don't have a lot of interventions, but I uh, personally recommend to all kids uh, with NF1 that they be evaluated by an experienced physical therapist. Doesn't mean that they need physical therapy necessarily, although my physical therapist that I work with thinks they do, um, or at least some of them, not every, all of them. But I think that the physical therapist can provide some skills, provide some uh, programs that may be uh, more beneficial than other programs. Um, and then you can develop the most effective physical exercise regimes. And uh, also, we didn't talk a lot about diet, but I think that there is a, uh, an importance in having an, uh, a good diet that's well-balanced, uh, vitamin D supplementation. Um, there are some studies going on uh, trying to see if that will improve some of the bone issues um, as well. But I, I hope that I've shown you that uh, we can make improvements. Uh, these are two of my patients showing off their muscles. Um, but I, uh, it's been a, a pleasure working with uh, the families uh, and they have made significant progress in the trial that we're doing. Many of the families have, and the kids have said, they feel like they're performing better in school just by doing this physical exercise program. Um, it's all anecdotal, so I, I can't really prove that. But I do think that by maintaining physical fitness, it will improve your quality of life. I need to do it. We all need to do it. Sometimes we forget um, that we focus on other aspects of uh, our, our health, but we forget to do the... Uh, the routine important things. So if you sit and watch 10 hours of TV and eat uh, ice cream all day, um, it doesn't matter if you take a pill um, 
that vitamin D is not going to really help things. You're going to need to do the other stuff as well.